The Diablo 4 team is doubling down on choices for every class. All right, here we go. I'm more happy right now about where Diablo 4 is than I was whenever it got announced. I feel like everything that they have said about the game, everything they have announced, everything they've talked about has been good. So we started with a couple of classes, um, and we had some really cool ideas for, um, for class mechanics that would be specific to those classes. Um, and it proved to be very compelling, not just in terms of the, the gameplay of the class, but also you know, if you're playing uh, a barbarian, and then you, maybe you're, you're grouped up with a sorceress, and the sorceress is using her class mechanic, it, it really, you look at that and you're like, oh, well, that, there's lots of really interesting gameplay there yeah, that I could check out, you know, in the future, maybe on a future season or, or something like that. And so we really wanted the classes to shine in their own ways and differentiate from each other. And then. So it's basically like making each class different so people want to go back and do playthroughs with different classes. I think that's kind of what Elden Ring does. People want to try and play, you know, like with a magic build, uh, you know, a melee build, a bleed build, etc. Uh, I think as long as the gameplay is good, then people will do this. It's the same as what they do with PoE, too. Uh, you know, like every league, most people play something a little bit different. Also, it goes back to that aspect of choice. Like when we, when we look at the class mechanics, we try to uh, design them in ways that increase the, the number of meaningful choices and ways that you can customize your character. So if you look at the Necromancer, for example, right, the Book of the Dead allows uh, for players who, you know, the Necromancer is a core part of Diablo as a franchise, right? It, it's uh, this, this really cool summoner class that ends up being really fundamental to gameplay. You can approach yeah. monsters in a totally different way with all of your minions, like getting in the way of projectiles, tanking monsters, you get this really cool fantasy of being this sort of general of the dead. But there are lots of different ways that people have played Necromancers in the, the, the franchise, right? You've got people who enjoyed playing Necromancers in Diablo 2, where they're kind of overseeing the battlefield and their minions are, are doing all of the, the combat. You've got this is a more action-packed Necromancer of Diablo 3, where you're like really manip you're really uh, sort of commanding your minions more directly. And you've got uh, players as well who want to play um, this sort of dark caster fantasy, but aren't necessarily attached to the army aspect of it, even though that's the, the uh, a big draw of the necromancer. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. It's the same thing with uh, with PoE, right? You have people that like playing uh, like carrying golems. You have people that like playing skeleton mages. People that like playing uh, summon uh, raging spirits. You know, they're all zombies, or they're not zombies, they're all minions, but they play much differently. Explosion is cool, just in general. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And who doesn't want to explode corpses, right? <laughs> exactly. So when you look at the, the class mechanics, we designed Book of the Dead to allow players to customize their necromancer to speak to that class. Oh, that makes so sense. I like, like that. Sacrifice your minions, um, yeah. you can adjust which ones. Like, I really want to have a golem, uh, but I don't want to have skeletons. I want to have skeletons, but not a golem. I want to have the biggest army I can. Yeah. And there are trade-offs and interesting choices that can be made all through that. I think that the, the, the nuance of that is really in the numbers. Because if the numbers say that golem is good and skeletons are bad, then no one's going to play skeletons because it's bad. Some people will, but like 90% of people will play Golem. And how do I know that? Because this is exactly what happens in Path of Exile. Is it one league? It's like, you know, like fucking somebody makes a video and it's like carrying Golems. This is all you need for carrying Golems. And I, 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 I this is what, what I did one time. And you know, like that cold iron spike, that fucking, it gives you like plus three to like all physical skill gems. Well, this weapon was like 15 chaos orbs, which is like 15 silver, let's say, in, in the game. And then it turned into being, I think like fucking 70 or like one exalt, two exalts, 
which is the equivalent of going from like 15 silver to one or two gold. It like quadrupled in price. It was insane because everybody saw that and everybody was playing it. So it needs to be, uh, oh, it's divine now. Yeah, you're right. Back then it was exalts. Um, it, 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 it's just, it's all about balance. Like this is a great idea, but balance decides whether this is a good idea or not. And it's interesting that it's like, to me, it's around adding depth without trying to add too much complexity. You know, you look at the Sorceress one with the enchantment system, it's incredibly powerful to have the ability for different skills fire based on what you're doing, whether it's like you're bringing down a blizzard every 10 seconds yeah. or your certain lightning is coming out of you or those sorts of things, but they're kind of, in a way, a passive ability. I don't have to trigger it. It's triggering based on either a condition or no, it's like based Rasha, on time. Yeah. And similar to... Um, the Necromancer's Book of the Dead is allowing you to customize and configure your army. It's not adding complexity necessarily to, oh, I have to worry about how I control differently. And so it makes things richer and more customizable because now even if I'm a fire sorceress mm -hmm. and you're a fire sorceress, the fact that what we put into our chance slots could make it very different in how we play and how we build on upon that. And well, that should matter. That's absolutely, yeah, you should give people the, the you shouldn't, a, a a successful balancing is whenever everybody is able to play multiple things. Somebody in chat said balance is boring. No, it's not. Balance is the opposite of boring because you can play more than one thing. Everybody who thinks balance is boring is sitting there playing classic World of Warcraft on their Fury Warrior using the exact same gear as every single other Fury Warrior in the raid. There's 12 of them, and then there's also 12 other rogues doing speed runs with the exact same strat over and over and over. That's what's fucking boring, is whenever some ability or some thing is so powerful that it just eclipses everything else, and it's so much better that if you're playing competitively or you care about your performance, you either have to make this decision or you're handicapping yourself in a substantial way. This No, balance is not boring. I guarantee fucking to you it's not. Whenever one thing is better than everything else, you take away choices because everybody who cares about their performance will feel like they have to go with that choice. It gives, me, it gives us access to like a two, couple more skills, which normally you'd be limited by your skill bar. And so that notion yeah. of that each class has a way to go deeper into the class fantasy and do it in a way that doesn't mean like, oh, now I have six more buttons I have to press or whatever. Like it keeps it deep and interesting and, and custom smart. without overwhelming you. Yeah, I like that. The skill trees have evolved uh, dramatically over the course of development, I would say. We're on number that four. That makes sense. Many oh. iterations. <laughs> and a lot of it has come, you know, one of our, our strategies here has been to like really share uh, as much as we can with the fans as often as we can. So we've gone out with uh, and talked about like here's where our skill trees are uh, in our you know in very like our log updates and like when we go to show show off the game um, and we've gotten lots of feedback feedback like there are I want to have more choices or you know I want to have lots of other options and so out of that have come like a number of revisions to the skill tree both for um, oh, there's going to be revisions to the skill tree every patch. I mean, that's what the patches are for. I, like, personally, I enjoyed playing with, like, the skill tree in WoW, the new skill tree that they did. I think it's pretty good. Now, are there things that are overpowered, and there, are there going to be meta builds? Yeah, there are. But whenever I was look, looking at everybody, every single person wasn't playing the exact same thing. And I think that's good making it clear uh, how you can progress through it, making it work for new players, mm -hmm. um, and um, ways to increase the depth. Um, and that's where we get into the Paragon system, you know, right. which comes online uh, as, you get, as you level up and get into the higher levels. And we've really tried to hit that uh, sweet spot where we're providing all of the opportunity for choice um, while not overwhelming players who you know, are looking at this big map of skills and, and you know, asking where to start, right? Mm -hmm. I, I love theory crafting. Like, I, that's one of the things that draws me to these types of games is 
how do I make a build? How do I set up skills? How do I make things work together? And you want a lot of depth there so that you have a lot of choice. So we're not just making the same build all the time. Like we're both fire sorcerers. So exactly. We know exactly yeah. what skills we're using. And, That's and true. So you want enough choice there that you can kind of customize it, make it feel unique to yourself, but not, I don't, there's games where you would go into it and you go like, oh, that's way too complicated. Just go look up a website. Tell me what. So, so he played Poe, and that's what he's talking. He's talking about Path of Exile right now. Uh, it's not there. There aren't games out there. It, he's talking about Path of Exile. Uh, yeah, and and this is true. Like he's absolutely right that there are a number of people that play Path of Exile, and they see the skill tree, and then they open the open the Atlas tree, and then they open the fucking uh, the Ascendancy, and then they're like, oh, what's this Pantheon thing? And it's like, what's Cluster of Gems? Oh, so you can customize the skill tree on top of that. And then, oh, wow, there's this other fucking thing, and then there's your Atlas. It's like, oh, my God. So, yeah, it is It's extremely complex. But I think that Diablo 4 should not be complex like PoE. And I don't think PoE is bad because it's complex. I think it should be a little bit simpler, to be honest. I think it's, it's too much at this point because like 10 years of you know, development and nuances. I'm really looking forward for PoE too. But at the same time, I, I think that Diablo can be that simple game. Like, remember Gauntlet Legends? Gauntlet Dark Legacy? That game was fucking awesome. And it was so simple. It probably had less abilities in it than Diablo does. But it was a fun game. So I don't think that the more complicated the game is, the better the game is. No, this is stupid. I think that if the gameplay is good, Diablo can be the new gauntlet. I have to put in, I'm, I'll print, you know, the old days and I'm old enough, I used to print it out and bring it to my thing and go like, okay, put a node here, put a node there, you know. And I have these in binders downstairs. I was just making yep. somebody else's build because the, the way you made a build was so complicated. I couldn't feel like I could own the theory crafting. And, and that's, I think, a line that we've been walking is trying yeah. to make sure that you have lots of choices, both active and passive skills, that, but is still sort of grokkable that you can go into. I think it's also that like giving players decisions that like whenever you, whenever you read what it does, it's understandable. And I think one of the worst examples of something being understandable is um, more versus increased in Path of Exile. More is a multiplicative scaler. Increased is just additive. So let's say you have 700% damage and you have a 10% increase. Now you have 710% damage. But if you have 10% you more, that's 770%, a bonus of 70% damage. It's fucking massive. So this is not communicated in the game. Now, obviously, you can look this up. You'll figure this out playing the game. But you want to have as few traps as possible like that. You want to have as few things that the player cannot easily test out for themselves and see, oh, I see how this works. Okay, this is less damage. So yeah, it's too much math. Well, it's not too much math. It's just that it's not it, it, it it's not immediately understandable by a person just by looking at it. What's wrong with traps? Well, because they're not fun. A, a, a trap is something that you should learn. A, 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 let me think of a way to put this. A, a, a trap is something that you should you, you should accidentally fall into. If the game puts a trap and you don't know it's a trap and you still fall into it, it's not your fault, it's the game's fault. Does that make sense? Recraft yourself and you can still create your own build. And I think as a player, like when I first came to the D4 yeah. skill tree, I really, I felt that notion of that, I talked about with the equation of that progression of D2 is, I really feel the D2 skill tree, that notion of inherited, you know, there's an inheritance there from skill to skill that you can take certain skills that impact other skills and so you can kind of build on top of them the way that you used to be able to do in, yeah. uh, in D2. And so I think that's really that notion of that the richness of the progression that was in D2. I feel that richness in D4. That's good. You talked about skills, connecting to other skills and building off of them. Um, that's another area where we've gone through a lot of iteration, right, to Mm -hmm. um, make those connections clear because you don't have this the connection where you know a skill is literally below this other skill and you must take right. one point in this and then you, that you saw in D2 yeah, yeah. but you have all of these sort of 
uh, natural connections between things like the skill causes bleeding and the skill benefits from bleeding. And right. so we've built this uh, skill tag system. We've authored this ability to search the skill tags. You can highlight nodes that are... Yeah, yeah. A lot of uh, a lot of games have this. I mean, WoW has this with achievements. Uh, Path of Exile has this. Yeah. Related to that, and so you can sort of see how these things are interconnected and mm -hmm. sort of assist the player in like... That's oh, good. Oh, there's some really cool interactions here to check. Yeah, give me all the skills that have bleeding in it, or would benefit bleeding, and then you go, oh, okay, I didn't, I didn't know that one was going to help it. Yeah. Um, so you can respec point by point. You can in, directly in the skill tree for gold, and that gold uh, cost ramps up uh, at some rate as you level up. So as you under like more clearly define your build and like get more things that are that are associated with it and supporting it, it becomes a little bit more expensive to respect, but still doable. Um, so those choices have, have meaning. Mm -hmm. And at the early part of the game, it's very, very um, uh, inexpensive, uh, very small gold cost. So you feel like, oh, like, I'm going to try this skill. Like, oh, I didn't like that skill. I'm going to try this skill. Or like, oh, that skill looks exciting. Let me try. I think that what they should do is they should just make it to where you can respect whenever you want for free. I think that would be good. Uh, I've never seen a value in making it to where you have to spend gold. Like, my experience in a video game has never been improved by not being able to respec easily. For example, in Classic WoW, I didn't play the game as much because I didn't want to respec all the time to play PvP or to play Fury Warrior in PvE or, uh, you know, to play tank or something like that. Like, it's just not fun. It's like conduit energy. See, it's not a meaningful choice to have to just sit there and spend gold on something because you made a bad decision. I, I think that PoE does this in a bad way, too. In my opinion with PoE, I think until you finish the campaign, respecting should be completely free. Like, for new players, it's like, oh, you made a shitty build and your build doesn't work anymore and you're hard stuck in Act 6? Great. Well, go respec everything and try something totally different. Every time that Blizzard has tried to go for a meaningful choice in a game... All they've done is make the game worse. Please do not make the game worse for some amorphous, uh, e ephemeral idea that nobody can even really contest. Nobody can even quantify. Nobody can really even explain why it's meaningful that you have these things because it's not really meaningful. It's number one. It's a video game. Number two, you can respect. It's just a waste of fucking time. Like, stop wasting the player's time. I think that you should be able to respect for free whenever you want. That's that's the way I feel about it. That, but they need systems to delete gold? No, they don't. You just have seasonal resets that happen. And also, if you can't trade gold, the odds are the gold farming in the game won't matter that much. Yeah, no, you don't. It doesn't even make sense. Bad take on this one. No, I understand it. I understand this way better than you do. Trust me. I played a lot of these fucking games, and every single one of these games that I've played, I've played Path of Exile for 10 years. I played World of Warcraft for 15 fucking years. I know what I'm talking about, and every single fucking time that you add in some prohibitive respec cost, all you do is make the game worse. You're not doing anything else besides that. Yeah, respect costs just encourage people to use cookie cutters. Yes, and that's actually a really good point, is that if you increase the amount of cost and the amount of, like, uh, like the, the amount of meaningful choice there is in the game, people will be more concerned about making the right meaningful choice, and they won't play the game for themselves. They won't try to figure it out on their own, because they if they do it wrong, then they're going to have to pay a bunch of money to undo it. So, like, not only do you make a mistake, but now you're being punished for it. So, there's just no reason to do this. People defending Goldsing on character customization were fucked. Pack it up. No, it's just people defend every bad game design decision. It's nothing surprising or nothing special. Yeah, it makes the game more elaborate. Yeah, you can do whatever you want, man. It's fine. Uh, basically, stifle any creativity and experimentation. Exactly. It's totally brain dead to have a respect class. Yeah, just get rid of it, man. Fucking get rid of it. It makes the game worse. It just makes people feel bad for making bad decisions, and it makes people not want to try things and do experiments. 
Stupid people defending stupid game decisions. Yes, uh, what a surprise. Don't punish people. Yeah, stop fucking making games that punish people for playing them. It's just so fucking cringe to me. I hate it. Try this, right? And you can go back and forth really freely. And you can also do uh, uh, full respec uh, at any point as well. So, you know, a lot of the, as you build out the skill tree, you have things that unlock based on other nodes that you've yes. chosen. Um, so we spent some time um, making that as smooth as possible. And that's where we ended up in the skill tree itself. Like you're, you know, press one button to, to... Yeah, I mean, these are a lot like the Warcraft skill trees. Whenever you really break it down, it seems like they're kind of the same. And it's like, you know, the pick one or the other type thing. Sure. Yeah, somebody said, by the way, somebody mentioned that um, this is an extreme casual take. That's because this is an extreme casual game. Anybody that's not a casual is already playing Path of Exile, Grim Dawn, or something like Undecember. They're already, and they're probably just playing Path of Exile, because that's the best one out. So, it, yes, of course it's for casuals. No shit. To buy a skill and the other button to respawn that skill. So you really... Mm -hmm are just in that tree, like adjusting where all your points are and you don't have to like jump out and, and um, go to some other menu. <gasps> Bro, these guys <laughs> jump out and go to some other menu. What kind of menu, like an Atlas menu? Like, yeah, what, what other, yeah, which, which other one? What other menu are we talking about? Maybe a, um, you know, like a, uh, the, the divine spirit menu or whichever one, like the, the, it's not paragons. I forgot even what they were called. Yeah. It's just so obvious. The heist menu. Yeah. There that's you one go. of the things that's really different between D3 and D4 is like D3, once you get to a certain place, you, the difference between one build to another is like, I got to go change my clothes, you know, because you're really mm -hmm. focused on being set based or, um, very equipment based so that it, your build is kind of defined by your equipment more than anything else. So you're like, Oh, I want to change from fire to ice. Let me go change my clothes real quick. Right? And it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a very clear way of doing it, the kind of paper doll model. But one of the goals, the design goals, not to speak for Joe, but like one of the design goals is really to make the your build feel inherent to your character. Let me look at Joe, some of these abilities, the kind of okay? Model, but oh, this the, is Diablo 3, never mind. Your build feel inherent to your character. And that's one of the things about the, uh, the gold cost going up over time is that basically get you get there's going to be a point in time where, um, I'll make up a number, but like say at level 50, there's going to be a point in time where you go like, Oh, I would like to be a different barbarian, but it's too expensive to undo everything I've done. It's actually better for me to roll another barbarian and start a new one and go fresh. And you think that's good? Um, and we wanted that, that notion that like with each level you progress down a character, you're kind of becoming more and more attached to it and, and getting more and more sort of settled with it so that you're not just going, okay, I'm level 65. Why would somebody want to go and replay the campaign they literally just did because of an artificial limitation that you designed? Why would, uh, how would this make any sense? I have, and now I'm just going to change my clothes and become a completely different barbarian, you know? So cheap in the beginning, so lots of experimentation. Do I like fire? Do I like ice? Do I like lightning? Yes, no, turn it off. And I also love the fact that you can get... The thing is that... I can almost guarantee you that the way this game works, the gear is not going to be universal. If you have fire, ice, and, and lightning, there's probably some sort of fire damage or ice damage that you're going to get. So, and maybe not, maybe not, but with a lot of these games, there is. So there's going to be secondary effects that are better either way. Redo equals more gold equals more money. No, I don't think that's the case. They'll sell respects and gold. There is nothing that they have said or done or that has been data mined or leaked that has indicated that in any capacity whatsoever. So for you to say that, you, you have every right to think that after Diablo Immortal. But you have to acknowledge that by believing that, you are ignoring every single bit of evidence that exists. Yes, you, you, yes, you, yeah, I, I, this is crazy. Every single bit of evidence ha has been uh, disputing that. Is this lazy decision to overcome the problem of a respec? Yeah, exactly. What evidence? 
Okay. The fact that they have made statements multiple times saying that they will not have pay to win in the game. The fact that they have clarified those statements multiple times saying that they will not have pay to win in the game. The fact that they have responded to multiple comments and critiques, including my own, on Twitter and other resources, saying that there will be no way for you to earn player power or buy something on the store that you can sell in the game or anything like that in the game. So this is not something that they said in Diablo Immortal. The truth is that as somebody, this is my job to sit around and listen to this bullshit the fact is that Diablo Immortal made it intentionally vague what you can buy and what you can't buy in the game. They, did, they made very specific statements. They said, you cannot buy gear in the game. You see what I'm saying? But with Diablo 4, they said, you cannot buy player power. This is an all-encompassing statement. So... Wyatt Chang, whenever he said that you can't buy gear, he was telling the truth, but it was deceptive. Do you see what I'm saying? But in this case, unless they just outright lie, which could happen, they can't do that. Do you see kind of what I'm saying? Them selling a respec isn't player power. I think that it is. Um, I, I think that most people would not like that. Overall, and, and then also there was the data mining. People uh, got the Diablo 4 client. Uh, there was uh, different types of surveys that were used, uh, that were leaked, that were shown about like what would you be okay with and not okay with in the Diablo store. And all of these things and all of these points of evidence, none of them have leaked anything about the game being pay to win. Now, I know that there's a lot of people that still think it's going to be pay to win. You still think it will be pay to win. And then when the game comes out and it's not pay to win, you're going to think to yourself, oh, well, they're just waiting to get us on the line. Then they're going to make it pay to win. I do not know how much evidence you need to think that it's not going to be pay to win. And I'm not saying, like, for sure it won't be. But I think that with every single bit of evidence that they have showed and shared that has been also shared, keep in mind, without their consent and more importantly, against their consent with like people breaking NDAs, not a single thing has come out about this game being pay to win. Not a single fucking one. Asmongold dying on this hill? Well, then stop trying to kill me on it because I'm fucking right. I'm fucking right. Yet? Of course it's yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm right. Listen, no you're not, yes I am. Absolutely. See, this is the thing, is that I have, I, I've watched all of these videos. I've seen all of the fucking data mining shit. I've seen all of it. And people are like, no. No, it's going to be pay to win. So you think it's not, it is. Yeah, it's going to be pay to win. 100%. You know it, I know it, everybody knows it. Clip it so you can react to it in six months after the game comes out? Why would I be stupid to think this? If the game becomes pay to win in six months or a year whenever the game comes out, I'm not stupid because I thought the game wasn't going to be pay to win whenever there was no reason to think that it was going to be pay to win. There's having an opinion based off of impartial evidence and then having that opinion is, oh, this is what's going to happen. And then something new happens. It doesn't mean that you're stupid for thinking the first thing. Oh, my God. Some people are so fucking stupid. It's sad. Let's read there. Let's, let's see if there's any actual good comments about this. OK, no, you'll just be wrong. Being wrong doesn't make you stupid being wrong about something whenever being wrong about something whenever new evidence is presented is not the same as being wrong about it at the time that you said it you're stupid for believing in blizzard still that's fine i've said this before if you think that the game is pay to win 
you are totally entitled to that opinion. But you have to acknowledge, if you believe that it is pay to win, that you have actively discarded all evidence. You have discarded all evidence, all information, everything to come to this conclusion. So yes, you can believe it's pay to win if you take in no evidence. Game companies have lied about this kind of thing before, but you're probably right. Of course they have lied, and there is a chance that Blizzard could lie. But expecting everybody to lie is just the same as expecting them all to tell the truth every single time, even despite other evidence. I think we should just wait to see what's going to happen, but there's no indication that the game is going to be pay to win. What are you talking about? There's plenty. Okay, oh, here we go. Bro, what are you talking about? There's plenty of evidence like previous games. So, so, so if Blizzard does one thing in one game, so, so let me get this straight. So do you think, so under that logic that they, that there's evidence in other games, if somebody told you that there's going to be a gem system in Overwatch 2 that makes Widowmaker's uh, gun, if you have a five-star gem auto-aim for you during her ultimate, does that mean that it's just categorically true because they did this in Diablo Immortal, so they must be doing it in Overwatch? It's just so stupid. I can't imagine being so fucking stupid to think like this. It's sad. Here we go. Skills through equipment that you can access the skills before maybe you would be even be able to from a level perspective and go, oh, I, I picked up this skill on my sword or my boots and mm -hmm. I'm gonna go try it out and see if I like it or not. Um, so I love that ability to go in and buy a skill and, and feel no regret and paying for it to, to yep. with with in-game gold to, to get rid of it um but then wow i got you know once you get up there you know you're level 90 you're going like uh i think i'm yep. just gonna you know i, I think i'm not gonna try to undo spend a, a million whatever it's gonna be to undo all these skills so i i love that sort of sense of i don't know hardening cement it's like over time you know there's a sense of permanence that starts to happen the further deeper you go into that character yeah, I think that's bullshit. I I, th I think that's complete fucking bullshit. There's no reason that you need to harden the cement of the character. This is a pointless metaphor that you invented in your mind that will end up wasting players collectively thousands of hours. Stop it. You're not making the game better by making it take longer. You're not making the game be better by making people roll two barbarians. It is so fucking dumb. Like, am, am I crazy here? I think this is so stupid, man. That's the point of view of, uh, of a designer and not a player. Well, you've got to remember who the audience is. The, the audience is, uh, I mean, like, listen, this is what happened with Covenants. Yeah, this is ridiculous, man. 5x berserker surprised yeah i think it's stupid i i and i am actually surprised that they're doubling down not doubling down on this they haven't really talked about it a lot but but that they're going down this meaningful choice uh fucking road again because they just failed at that with wow they spent an entire expansion failing at that they spent the entire previous expansion failing at that and the one before that they were failing at it with the legendaries so how is it that you fail at something in your this is a, probably world of warcraft is the closest analogy that you're going to have to diablo 4 probably somewhere at diablo 3 as well too but world of warcraft is obviously getting worked on much more than diablo 3 it's hard to know really what what their design goals are with diablo 3 now that like nothing happens in the game other than like them oh now this thing does 8000 percent damage instead of 400 percent damage so now it's the meta so that's the thing is that you, you they, they they failed at this every single fucking time and again even if you don't take in the context of the failing of every single fucking time you also just have to look at it objectively my experience as a player will not be improved if i have to level a second barbarian to play another build period i don't want to do it i don't think it's fun it's not it's repetitive it's punishing, it's boring, it's slow. 
there's no th there's no upside to this if you played Diablo 2 you know that creating a new character is not a big deal unlike in WoW completely different if it's not a big deal then why do you have to do it So everybody will play copy pasta characters? Yes, they will, because they don't want to make the wrong character and then have to make another one later. It's a strange decision, yeah. It's so dumb, man. I don't understand it at all. It's literally just a time waster. Yeah, it's so, so stupid. I mean, same thing happens in PoE. Yeah, and I think that, that how many people like, how many people do you think played PoE and then put their own talents in and then they got bricked at, like, Kitava or, you know, realistically probably Act 6 because the resistances went down a lot and, and then they just quit the game because they didn't want to respec. They looked it up. They're like, oh, this is going to take a lot of orbs of regret. I can't afford this. Like, I don't want to do it anymore. Yeah. That's horrible. PoE is, is not fun to replay the axe. Diablo 2 was. Oh, bad comparison. So you think that the that you think my comparison was bad because of your subjective decision? Because there's a lot of people that like replaying the axe in PoE. So so your subjective evaluation on if the axe are fun to play or not is why the system is good. It doesn't make any sense. the end of the video okay all right yeah. never mind okay uh, i'm gonna go ahead and i'm going to uh, uh on the testing and its live service plans wait a second what's this here when did this come out did i see this this came out two fucking days ago holy shit okay well we're gonna watch another one of these and then we'll watch something else after that uh there's apparently a lot of diablo 4 uh a lot of diablo 4 content so this is good we've got a lot of stuff to look at so this enforces video too. Yeah, I'll just watch it. I mean, it's personal. Yeah, I just don't like repeating it. Specifically, uh, standard is there for folks that don't want to level. All I'm saying is that I think that making a player re-level over and over and over is just simply not... This is not fun. And also, if you contextualize this around the fact that Diablo 4 is supposed to be a casual game. Like, I feel like, it, it, is, it, is it stated that it's supposed to be a casual game? No, but it's kind of implied with how many times they say, oh, you don't have to go to a bunch of menus or look at a bunch of stuff. I think the idea is for Diablo 4 to be simpler and easier to get into. And they mention this multiple times with, like, not having a bunch of abilities, being able to customize them, etc. So why is it that you're adding something that is casual, unfriendly? I don't understand it. Some developers hate the fact that you can see someone's build and just copy it in a few seconds. Yeah, but that doesn't stop you from making a new character and copying it every step of the way. PoE should have proven that endgame is what makes people invested. Why are developers make the grind early and the story so important? I don't understand. You can still reset with gold. You shouldn't have to reset with anything. And if it just costs more gold, and then it's harder to respec later on, I think that this is just a prohibitive cost that makes the game worse and adds no gameplay and just punishes casual players and people for trying to try different things in their own game because they're having fun with it and they want to try something new. There's no, there, there's, there's no logic to this. It's just a stupid decision that I think that the only reason why people are okay with it is because the games have always been like this. That like, oh, well, it's 50 gold to respec. Why? It doesn't make sense. This mindset is, uh, is stupid. I think it is too. Yeah, absolutely. The fix this in PoE 2, which shows that they recognize it's a shit mechanic. Yeah, I hate respecs. Gold sink. Uh... 
it, it, it's number one, it's not an MMO. Number two, with the types of trading that you have, gold sinks are not necessary. Number three, if you have a seasonal system, the economy will not last long enough for the gold uh, for the gold inflation to be so high that it will be problematic. Also, you can always just readjust the amount of gold that could even exist in the economy in the first place for the gold sinks to not matter. It's just this is it, it's just such a it's so dumb. I just I don't understand how people try to make sense out of something that's so fucking stupid, man. Oh my god. Let's see here. The base of it is to remove respec uh, to the situation at hand. Most people don't do that. Most people aren't going to go through and respec their character every time they fight a new boss. It's not going to happen for casual players. This is something for like hardcore sweaties to do. And even the hardcore sweaties probably aren't going to do that. Do you know why? Because they're going to have a meta build that can do everything by itself and they'll have gear good enough to do it without having to respec. Because if you're respecing, that takes time. Clicking all those buttons takes time. It, it's just it's just so stupid. Anyway, let's go ahead and let's watch this other one here. Uh, overall, I think the interview was a W interview. The respec thing was fucking stupid, but everything else was fine. testing and live service plans. Okay, here we go. I think it's really interesting that one of the things coming to Blizzard and coming to the Diablo team and, and seeing a lot of the, the kind of way that they do testing. You know, there's a phrase that's used a lot um, around soup tasting, which is this notion of, oh, we, we're going to put it together, but you always have to taste the soup and it doesn't need more salt, doesn't need more flavor. Do we, did we do too much of something or not enough of another? You can't eat this soup standing up, your knees buckle. <laughs> and this is probably, I mean, I've been making games for like 22 years now, and this D4 is the game that I felt like has been more holistically tested than any other game I've been a part of because it's really part of the philosophy of Blizzard and, and of this team in particular to be able to go in and be able to go, okay, we can play from beginning to end, let's play. And so whether that's, oh, we're, the whole team is getting the ability to bring the full game at home over Christmas to play it and give feedback. And then the notion of we're gonna allow the entire company at Blizzard to go and play it and give feedback. And now we're gonna allow all of ABK to go play it and give feedback. And we just went through friends and family, which is all of ABK plus their friends and family to go play it and give feedback on the full game. Yeah. And now we're going into end game beta which is going to be even more because we're going to, we went out and looked at who are people who are in I think this is probably true based off of the fact that they've had so many leaks. Yeah, I, I mean, no, I, I think this is actually true because whenever you compare the amount of leaks with this game versus the amount of leaks with like uh, Overwatch 2 or uh, any of the Warcraft expansions, uh, Diablo 4 has had infinitely more leaks. So it's probably because they gave it out to infinitely more people. It just makes sense engaging with the previous Diablo games and sort of the rich end game systems that are there and giving, we want to hear what they think of D4. And then we're going to be going into open beta, you know, next year where we're going to be, you know, trying to crush our servers and trying to get as much feedback as we can there. And so all along as part of this iteration, and, you know, great. and on top of that, we're doing global insights and user oh, research yeah. and we're do, bringing, doing surveys and bringing people in for user testing. So a lot of this iteration is not just us sitting in, alone in our offices coming up with a new idea. It's born out of feedback from the blogs, feedback from people playing, whether it be on the team, to the company, to friends and family, to um, just a lot of inputs into it. And it, it's really, I think you can see that if, if you've been part of it over the last few years, you can see that iteration and refinement happen because of those tests. Yeah, you know, you mentioned Endgame Beta. Um, this is one of the first times that we've... That's what really matters is the end game. Because the campaign is only going to last for a small period of time. Most players will probably get through the campaign. And if the end game can't retain them, then the game's dead. That's the problem with Diablo 3, is the end game is just terrible. Now the campaign matters because if the campaign is really bad, they'll never make it to the end game. But I think the end game is really what's going to make a big difference. I said, like, how to test specifically for the end game. Um, and the reason uh, we think it's really important is because 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, we talked about how Diablo 4 is a live service, how we have yeah. really exciting things to, to come with Seasons, um, how they're going to be really uh, big and crunchy and meaningful. Yeah, Seasons have to be very transformative. Like the Path of Exile Seasons are extremely transformative, sometimes too much so. So, you know, it's, it's really important not just to support that, but also because we know that we have so many players who enjoy playing Diablo for you know, way past the campaign, really getting into the, the end game systems. And so um, this gives us an opportunity to, you know, test the end game systems before uh, we get to launch and then make adjustments. You were talking about players getting through the D2R mm -hmm. very quickly. Yeah. Um, so this will give us an opportunity to, to sort of uh, test the test where we are with that early enough yeah. before release that we can make. This is smart and a good idea. Uh, I think that this is the mistake that they made in Diablo 3. If you guys ever remember back in Diablo 3, I was there uh, in the Diablo 3 beta that only was up to Leoric. And guess what? Act 1 was fucking flawless. And then the second that you stepped into those fucking sands, you had the wasps that shot the mini wasps, and the mini wasps disappeared randomly, and then they would hit your character and you would die. So they need to test a bunch of other stuff. They can't just have it where, okay, well, the game is uh, it's decent where it's at now, and we're just going to, you know, hopefully the rest of it is going to be fine. No, they should test everything. Act 1 was buggy too, just less buggy. It was so much less buggy that the way I remember it is that it wasn't buggy at all, okay? That's how bad Act 2, 3, and 4 were. Some small adjustments to, to end game systems and really make sure that when uh, the game comes out um, and players finish the campaign, there's some content there that has had some, some testing against it and had some, some yeah. adjustments made, so it's... It, they're not um, beta testing it at launch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Diablo. Yeah, imagine, imagine that, right? I mean, that would be crazy if that happened. You know, wouldn't that be just really funny? Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, last time that happened, uh, I, I feel like Path of Exile has set the bar for what seasons are in an ARPG. So I really hope that the Diablo 3 or sorry Diablo 4 season is not we are rebalancing the set the set bonuses of all of the class sets so the class set that was good last league isn't good this league To do what the same thing I don't know about that and that's that's what I'm worried about, is that I'm worried that the seasons will not have, like, every single POE season brings in, like, pretty much every single one brings in new bosses. It brings in a new system, a new mechanic, something like that that is transformative to the game. It has to happen. Well, it's a systems game, right? That's what we talked about. Like, you know, look at my experience with D3. I played D3 for hundreds of hours, like, literally hundreds of hours, and I've played the campaign in D3 probably twice. Stay a while and listen. Um, and so that notion of like, yeah, it's have to, it has to be a kick-ass campaign. You have to have great context and great story. Know what it is, that why the world yeah. is the way it is and, and set it all up. But you're unleashing players after they complete the campaign. You're unleashing them into a game that hopefully will entertain them for thousands of hours. And so yeah. in the past, we really haven't had that opportunity for people just to go into it and say, okay, this is the starting point because this is certainly not the end. This is not where, like, this is the beginning. Of yeah, the campaign has to be good. Effectively, that's what he's saying, right? Campaign has to be good. It has to be fun because if the campaign sucks, people aren't even going to make it to the end game. Like, I, I am not a fan of, oh, the game gets good after. Uh-uh. No, it has to be good immediately. Where this live service becomes in that thousand hours starts not where it ends and so yeah but we want it to be to feel rich because we're going to have seasons and you're going to have seasons are going to change up the game and so it's you know lit. there'll be lots of stuff to add incrementally as we go but there we want to know that when that person finishes the campaign that they immediately have something really cool to go and do and start to engage with those systems even more fully as they work their way to beat that level 100 boss On up to four se up, up up to four seasons, I think 
I think three to four seasons a year is fine. Two is probably too few seasons. I think three to four is fine. We've been trying to be a little cagey just because, you know, one of the things that we're still working through is when you work on a live service, the notion of um, what you want and when you want it, the, the pressure starts to change. I want my Because, want you know, when you're building a game like we are now, it's really a lot of focus is on what you want, like what, what's the right game and how to yeah. get the right quality and, and all the features that we want to have. And so, you know, we set our date based on making sure we can get what we want to be considered mm -hmm. what D4 should be. But when you start that train of now we're a service and people are expecting seasons where you, yeah. I think, succeed on players' minds is having consistency to know, oh, every three months there's a new season coming. And so if you go like, well, my ambition is I want to do a little more here, so it's actually going to be three months and three weeks, and then you start to lose that promise to the player and they don't know when to predict or how to think about it. And I think that if it's an extra couple of weeks or even an extra month for the season, this is not a big deal as long as the next season is good. I think a really good example of that is Internet Historian. There are people that upload every single day, and there are people who are like Internet Historian who upload, I don't know, probably less often than Diablo 4 is going to make seasons. But it doesn't matter how long it takes, because when the next one comes out, it's really fucking good. And that's what matters. It's better to, to take it slow and release a good season than just pop one out and release an L. So we, our, our intention is to have a, a heartbeat. I've not watched the reason one. I watched the reason one. Players can rely on. I'm sorry. Those both from a season perspective and from an expansion perspective. And so that's something we're working towards. So as we, you know, we're still in the finishing touches of development and we're still working through that, how do you build a season to ensure that you can deliver it in a timely way with the right scope and quality? Yeah. Um, that's why you're hearing a little softer language and saying it's definitely every three months and da, da 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 That's smart. That's smart. They should not tie themselves to a, the seasons will be at this time in this way every single time. Yes, this is smart. But I think when you look at historically what has happened, like those sorts of things are generally quarterly seasons is where it feels good from a Diablo perspective. And yeah. So I would say like up to four, but we're trying to allow ourselves a little leeway, especially coming. Yeah, it's up to four. I feel like realistically they're not going to do more than four. I think five is too many realistically. Yeah. And also like Internet Historian is just one example. Uh, you've got uh, Barney, uh, Seth, uh, Uber Danger. Uh, let, let's see. There's probably another one if I can think of it. Uh, Pint. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, those are some of them that we watch all the time. So, yeah, it doesn't matter how long it takes. If the next one is good, that's all that matters. Pint has a new video. I know I've got to watch it. I know I've, I'm actually very far behind in my reacts. So I apologize, guys. I'll try to, um, after I get to 60 in New World, then I'm kind of on an even keel there. Uh, I'll I'll do more reacts, uh, you know, instead of just only two or three hours of reacts. I feel like we never have enough time. Transition from shipping a game to in to transitioning into a live service is one of the hardest transitions, I think, because you have a team that's just come off of, of shipping a game. Uh, there's an immediate demand for making sure that you're ahead of the game for live, you know, for more content that's ready to go. And there's always this pressure to pull from that content, those people to come and work on the main game. It's like, why are you over there? I could, I could use you over here. Yeah. And so that transition from game to service is, is a really tricky um, part of that development. And so that's kind of why you hear a little bit of softer language until we get through that transition and then that language will harden quite a bit. The design of D3 Seasons is um, certainly a foundational element for us here. I hope not. The Diablo 3 seasons are fucking boring. You know, one of the really cool things about D3 seasons is that you get um, a fresh start with every season. You know, you get that. Why is why was having to level your character again a cool thing? Opportunity to try, you know, if we we're talking about how different all the classes are. You get to try a, a different class or try a different build for a class and try it in an environment where there are changes to the meta or other changes. And where we see that going with Diablo 4, is um, not just changes um, that we can do. You know, Rod spoke about uh, you know having a team of people who are working on that. So it's not just changes that we can do 
um, to the meta, but also additional features that can come in yes. you know, um, yes. with seasons and really making them um, uh, transformative. Make them transformative, different, new, exciting. Make playing season seven different than playing season six. It was also different than playing season five. Change up the gameplay of Diablo in meaningful ways. Yes, um, this is good to hear. And having exciting new things. This is great to hear. So. Yeah, what I love about seasons too is it allows you to test things and try things. And so if something's working, you know, as mm -hmm. opposed to, oh, we're only delivering a game every X years. And so yeah. you kind of, you don't have the ability to sort of refine and iterate over time. That's so true. We can try a thing in seasons and go, hey, what do we think about this? And people go, oh, this is my, actually, this is my new favorite thing in game that this thing you, and we're like, oh, really? Okay, well, let's, we're going to keep it now and we're going to go and do something else or. Yes. So I don't know, is it maybe like whenever something goes core in PoE, right? I mean, all you need to do is just do the exact same thing. Everybody liked Delve, Delve went core. Remember whenever Synthesis came out? <laughs> Fuck that. Nope, that was gone. Oh, we can refine things that maybe, you know, like it just allows us to play a little bit more. But I love like what I think brings a lot of people back mm -hmm. for D3 is that, that fresh start that Joe talked about, that notion of, oh, you've changed the meta and I want to kind of go and experience that progression again, but maybe as a different class or with the same class with a different build because there's new skills or new legendaries or new ways to experience the, the game. And I think that's going to be a big part of our season sort of thinking as well as like, okay, like how can I come back and revisit this and, and play it in a different way in a different class with new features and new content. New features and new content. Let's focus more on that than replaying the fucking campaign. Please, let's focus more on the new features and new content than, oh, the six is now a 75 and so now it's overpowered and so you should play it now. Please, let's focus on the new fucking content. The end game beta, okay, here we go. Because where we're at right now is just, we're moments away from end game beta going. And I think that's, again, as Joe talked about earlier, that's the first time that we're really doing this kind of a test. And um, <coughs> it's part of the soup tasting, it's part of that, do we need more salt, do we need more pepper kind of thing. All right, give me a taste. Mm. But we're feeling really good coming off of all the other tests that we've had. Like, again, we've had the ability for people, a lot of people, to play from <coughs> prologue to epilogue. Um, and that's that. But when the, one of the things that's hard to capture is when you think about endgame, when we talk about people who play for hundreds, if not thousands of hours in the game, it's really hard to get that kind of testing because you get, okay, you're playing a beta, <coughs> you can play for a couple of weekends or you can play for a couple of weeks. And Excuse me. You're not necessarily putting in a thousand hours or whatever, right? And so we wanted to... Yeah, there are things that become problematic as time goes on. It's it's kind of like what I was saying about like sound effects. Whenever a sc or, you know you hear a sound effect and it's really cool, and then like you hear it for the 780th time, and it's not as cool anymore, it's just fucking annoying. So you really want to make sure that you're avoiding that. Seinfeld's too old for you? Bro, I went back and I tried to watch Seinfeld again. I was like, oh, maybe it's adult jokes. I didn't understand them. I watched it as an adult. I still thought it was stupid. It's, <coughs> it's funny. I think Jerry Seinfeld's a fucking funny comedian. But I never liked the show. <coughs> <coughs> Bro, I, I fucking always breathe my fucking liquids, man. Oh, my God. It's so annoying. <clears throat> I have the same shit happen to me every fucking day, man. Have a time to just soak in that experience. Okay, there's no campaign for you. Yeah. You're just, you're just, all you have are the things that will be available to you in game, whether it be Nightmare Dungeons or uh, Helltide or PvP or yeah, the whatever. Whisper bounty system. Like these are things that are, we want to make sure can really um, hold up mm -hmm. for players that once they finish the campaign. Um, and that's a really exciting place to be. You know, like I said, I have a game that's been playable from prologue to epilogue for so long is really different for me. It's really refreshing and it's really been about how we continue to polish and bring it up and bring it up and bring it up and find those iterations. And it's been also really interesting that with the philosophy of the Diablo team to be able to talk to players quarterly. Um, historically, I haven't done that. That's not something we've done is sort of brought them along on the journey. We've, um, 
Yeah, I think that the updates that the Diablo... I, I feel like the Diablo team in general has done a really good job. I'm going to be honest. Like, I really think that they've done a good job. Uh, I can't think of anything that was, like, problematic or, like, stupid that I didn't like. Uh, I, I honestly think that they've done a very good job so far, like, talking to people and keeping people up to date. And, or, and testing has tended to be like, here's a multiplayer beta for some weekend. It hasn't been, hey, we're going to get beta testing on the whole game. We're going to let you soak in it for 100 hours and tell us what you think kind of thing. Yeah. And so that's really been informative from a design perspective. But that's kind of where our big push is now. Like, we feel good about where we are with the campaign. A lot of it is implemented. A lot of VO is implemented. We're sort of finishing up the cinematic part of the story. Blessed mother. We're honing in on making sure the end game is where it is. We're making sure we're, that we have things in place that we're, we've already started, you know, season one work uh, and those sorts of things that so we can be prepared for when the players finish, that they're ready to be able to, you know, have more there waiting for them when they, when they finish the campaign. And, and, That's good. Um, and the first season starts. So, I don't know, was, was there, like, feeling, feeling good right now, honestly. I think it's a great summary. I mean, it's a very exciting time for Diablo 4 and an exciting time for the franchise overall. That's crazy. Of sanctuary. Hey. Lilith. That was really cool. That cinematic was great. I liked it a lot. Talk is meaningless unless it's uh, specifics of the products. Well, yeah, it is. I mean, they're talking about specifics in a lot of cases. Yeah. Uh, they always said uh, that, don't they? Well, I, I feel like in general... As somebody who has been paying attention to Diablo 4, I think that they've done a very good job keeping people up to date with what's happening with Diablo 4. In the last year, keep in mind, we've gotten more updates for Diablo 4 than we've gotten for Path of Exile 2. Keep that in mind. So I, I feel like they've done a good job. Absolutely. <clears throat> Blizzard Cinematics are better than their games. I feel like uh, everybody was expecting, uh, you know, the Warcraft movie to just be like a, you know, one and a half hour Blizzard cinematic. So, yeah. Uh, do you think that they really care or is it a marketing strategy? Well, w what is, is making a good game a marketing strategy? Because then people like playing your game. Yes. So I don't care if they're pretending to care for marketing or not. If they pretend well enough, then I'm happy because that means they'll actually do it. Grinding your games is kind of silent on how PoE2 is going. Yeah, and that's fine. That, that's, that's another way that you can do it. It's not like you can't do things that way at all. But personally, I, I like hearing the updates and knowing what's going on. <clears throat> There's a shift in business focus lately. It's all about customer feedback and now incorporating that into your product. I mean, yeah, I wonder fucking why. Uh, I think that's because they've had so many flops because they didn't do that next time. They're testing endgame. It's badass. It gives me hope. Yeah, I do hope that there are some things that like, you know, endgame boss fights that they don't test until the game comes out because I feel like it's really exciting whenever people actually get to that point and they can see it for the first time. Whether I, I thought that was really cool whenever they did that in Sepulchre in, uh, in WoW, and I think that's really cool whenever they do that anywhere. Whenever it's like everybody can experience it for the first time, like Elden Ring, for example, it's like, oh shit, okay, like now finally people are seeing what's like to kill the first, to last boss or something like that. Yeah, some cool stuff, keep hidden. Yeah, keep as much hidden as you can, but if you ever have to make the decision, do we want to ship this broken or test it? You probably want to test it. What exactly they put in the game uh, that the community asked for? Um, I think that the main thing that they put into the game is more customization. I think the open world is something that people wanted to see. And I think also more uh, robust talent trees were important. Uh, the different types of different classes. Uh, I know people wanted to see Druid. And, uh, you know, Necromancer, you've got to keep in mind, was an afterthought with Diablo 3. It wasn't even added until like over a year after the game came out, over a year after Reaper of Souls even came out. So things like that. Yeah, I would say so. 
So I stopped playing the beta. Didn't want to spoil everything in Endgame. Yeah, I don't usually play betas a whole lot. Like, I'll play the Diablo 4 beta. I mean, whenever the fuck this comes out, I'm going to just, like, big dick this. Like, th these are both IGN interviews. You guys want to uh, go ahead and uh, watch the video yourself or uh, give it a like, give them a follow. I'm glad that they did these. These are really nice to have. And that way you actually have real information. You know what I mean? Uh, well, PoE 2 isn't just an Overwatch... Two situation, it's going to be different ascendancies, how sockets work, and uh, but how you get the same in game through axe. Well, no, I understand that PoE2 is going to be substantial. Like, I'm I'm extremely excited about Path of Exile 2. Like, I am I, I am equally, if not more, excited about PoE2 than I am about Diablo 4. I would say equally for sure. Like, I am extremely excited for it. I hope it's going to be great.